Well, good morning. Welcome back to Walden Community Church. My name is David. I'm the senior pastor here, and we are going through the seven miracles that are recorded in the book of John. We are up to five, five signs from the book of John. Last week, we read the famous story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. You know, there's a, a story, there's a joke that goes, uh, one time a little boy was asked in Sunday school what his favorite Bible story was. And he said, I like the one where everybody just loafs and fishes. I'm sure many of you have those very same plans this summer. Jesus took five loaves and two fish and filled everyone's stomach. Everyone had as much as they could eat, fed 5,000 people, and then afterwards, 12 baskets of scraps were picked up, which is considerably more than they even started with. And the story ends in John chapter 6 with, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Which means, of that massive crowd, before this all started, there were still a lot of people who were perhaps unsure about who this Jesus was. He had done some miracles that they'd only heard about. They knew that their own religious leaders didn't like him. So tell you what, let's grab the kids and follow this guy out into the wilderness and see what he has to say. But they all got more than they expected. They all got to take part in a miracle. So this time they didn't just hear about it, this time they were a part of it. Now, there's no question. Without a doubt, they witnessed it for themselves. Before this, many people were, were following Jesus out of curiosity. Some had been following him out of desperation. You know, they're, they're hoping that somehow Jesus could help them with their illness or their, their plight. Others were following Jesus in the hopes that maybe he would, you know, rescue them from the tyranny of Rome. But now, witnessing this live event, there's no doubt. And the people think, you know, Jesus could be the one. Th this could all start to make sense. So the crowd concludes, he must be the prophet. Which prophet? Well, the prophet listed in Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him that you shall listen. That prophet. They believe that, hey, the time has come. This is the one that we have been waiting for. They have a savior who met their hunger needs, right? And hey, we're going, we're going all the way to Rome. Watch out, watch out Rome, here we come. And everyone agrees. This is what we need the most. We need this guy to be our king, to be our leader. But the crowd isn't always right. And this is not why Jesus came. The next verse says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Jesus is already in a remote place because originally he wanted some downtime. He wanted some alone time. He really wasn't trying to get popular. He was trying to pace himself. You know, the quicker he rises to fame, the quicker the powers that be are gonna to try to put a stop to these things. So now he's a little bit more than halfway through his ministry and he sees once again, the people have the wrong thing in mind. Jesus has no political ambition. It was not his desire to be popular. He didn't come to make all of our lives easier. His desire was to complete the mission that the Father had given him. In Luke chapter four, Jesus reads his mission statement. It says the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to be the savior of the world, not just Israel, 
Jesus came to put an end to sin, not Rome. So when people start to move quickly and they're thinking that they're going to force Jesus to be king, he quickly rejects it. He, he is a different kind of king from a different kind of kingdom. So as they approach, he withdraws. In Mark's account, it says, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. Jesus needed to make sure he's still on track. You know, you, you see everybody else around you, they have plans and you could listen to them and, and oh yeah, they, they could start to make sense. Th their plans aren't bad per se, but he needs to keep his perspective. So he says, it's time for me to go be with the father. It's time to make sure that my will is lined up with the father's will. But watch what happens next. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. The Gospel of Matthew tells us Jesus is not in the boat. In fact, it was Jesus who said, go ahead, go on without me. So he goes up to the mountain to pray. The disciples go in the other direction, out onto the lake, but a storm is coming. Now the disciples are in a lot of trouble. Apparently, they had started rowing across to Capernaum and they were trying to stay close to shore because maybe we can pick Jesus up along the way. But it's not working out that way. The wind is driving them further and further south and so much so that they lose sight of the shore and they have now lost the opportunity that Jesus could ever meet up with them. Matthew says the wind and the waves were against them. And even though Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they would have all been experienced with storms, their experience would probably have told them, don't get in a boat, <laughs> right? And where is Jesus? That would be the question that they would be asking. Why isn't he with them? The one time they need him, He's not there. I mean, Jesus just did a miracle for 5,000 people. But where's, where's their miracle? Jesus came to save the world, but right now, these men, they need saving. They probably felt all alone. Did he forget about them? Did Jesus just not care? I mean, what's going on? You've prayed that prayer before. I've prayed that prayer before. God, where are you? Have you forgotten about me? I mean, I know you're busy. I know you've got lots of people to, to look over and to listen to their prayers. And I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not special, but are you still up there? One of the truths we learn very quickly in life is that things don't always go according to plan. There are good days and there are bad days. There's also a lot of pain and suffering in the world, as we're seeing right now in the Middle East. But even closer to home, maybe uh, you have been diagnosed with a, a sickness or you've lost your job or a loved one has passed away or you feel like, man, my, my prayers sure are taking a long time to be answered. And, and despite doing your best and, and praying, you know, your condition hasn't gotten any better. On the one hand, I mean, you're, you're God's child, you're doing everything you, you can, doing, doing your best. But on the other side, you don't have an answer as to why you're going through what you're going through. And you're saying, when I feel alone, where is God? Romans 8 tells us that God works all things together for good to them that love God. Well, if that's the case, then why don't Christians live a worry-free, drama-free life? Many people think that God has given them 
a tough life. Some have an easy life, but some believe that they suffer more than others. But that's not the case. Every, everyone has their own unique trouble. Your, your friends might not have the same trouble as you. Your, your problems might not be the same as mine, but everyone has their own share of struggles. God does, God does not say that we will live a trouble-free life. In fact, God says the opposite. He says that he will be with us in our troubles. Do you believe that God is with you even in the midst of pain and suffering? Do you believe in the promises that God can deliver you even when something seems impossible? Do you trust in God even if you don't understand what's going on in your life? Our trials that we go through can sometimes be a test of our faith. Sometimes it's only when we are crushed and, and, and down that we see the face of God, and then we begin to learn to trust in him more. God is at work in our lives even when you don't recognize it, even when you don't understand it. And as we're going to see next, he is more than likely in the storm with you, calling out to you to rise above it. Verse 16 says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed out about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. In the book of Matthew, the disciples think that Jesus is a phantom. You know, how fishermen can <laughs> tell stories that are, you know, tall, tall tales, right? And, and, and there's, a, there's this strange form that's appearing out in the midst of the sea, and it can't possibly be a person, right? So it has to be a demon or it has to be a ghost. But whatever it was, it was scaring the living daylights out of them. But they didn't need to be scared because it was Jesus. It was Jesus walking across those waves. It was Jesus walking across those waves the same way you or I walk across pavement. And he obviously knew they were scared because he, reassur he reassures them. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. You know, I've never wanted a tattoo, but if I were gonna get any words of encouragement permanently placed on my skin, it would be these words from Jesus. Because when I am most afraid or when I feel most alone, I need to be reminded that Jesus comes to me in the storms of life. Isaiah 43 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Jesus had waited until the boat was as far out as possible and all their hope is gone, perhaps to show them that he may not come when we think he should come. He comes when we need him the most. Why did Jesus walk on the water? To show his disciples that the thing they feared the most, the wind, the waves, those things are merely stepping stones to him. So, in the book of John, we have all these signs that John is recording. Jesus has shown us that he can provide food and drink when we are hungry. He can provide health when we are sick. And now he shows that even the natural forces of this world obey him. You know, this past week, Nebraska and Iowa were struck by tornadoes. And when you see something like that in your mind, you're, you're, you know, you're seeing it, that, that tornado sweeping across the ground. In your head, you're thinking, there's nothing, there is nothing human that can stop this. Those men in that small boat, they're out on the lake, they're in the eye of the storm, they're alone, they're afraid. That's how storms are. 
That's how you feel. It, it doesn't have to be, though, wind and waves, does it? Each of us is going to face illness, the loss of a loved one, financial hardships, and to be in one of those storms, you feel the exact same way. Helpless, alone. Do you remember when Jesus asked Philip? He saw the 5,000 hungry people and he said, where are we going to buy food for all these people? Remember that? And Philip looked around and he said, there's no human way. Right? And therein lies the point. As long as our eyes are on the trouble, and as long as we're taking inventory of our own resources to combat whatever storm lies ahead, we are always going to come up short. But these words of Jesus should bring us comfort. It is I. Do not be afraid. The disciples are afraid of the waves. And Jesus walked on them. As if to say, the thing you're afraid of is under my feet. You know, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you should know that storms are expected. And when they come, they often test our faith. None of us like storms, but they're a part of life. And you can't ever plan for them. And they certainly don't come at a convenient time. One day you're standing on the beach with Jesus and you're eating fish and chips and the sun is shining and you're praising Jesus. And the next minute you find yourself forced out into the middle of the lake in a storm, and Jesus, where is he? He's nowhere to be found. The storms come. Yesterday was fine. And then whoosh, storm comes, and y now you're in a panic. Where's Jesus? I was just eating fish and chips with him, having a good old time. We're out there, we're having fellowship, and now he's abandoned me. He isn't in the boat. He's off praying or something. Doesn't he care about my finances? Doesn't he care about my relationship with my spouse? Doesn't he care about my health? Doesn't he care about my child? What's up with that, Jesus? You know, even though we may not like to hear it, sometimes God is going to allow us to sit in the storm as we learn to trust him. In fact, I may have to wait until the very last minute the fourth watch of the night, the time when you are feeling the most physical or emotionally or spiritually weak. And if that happens, I want you to remember three things. First, don't let the storm consume you. Don't let the storm consume you. Proverbs says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Sometimes we get to the storms and it just seems to control you. You get cancer, and so you immediately spend all your time and energy trying to find out everything you can about cancer, as if somehow obtaining knowledge about it is gonna give you control over it. Or you become preoccupied with your children and where they go and their every movement and what they're, what they're doing at every second, but you can't, you can't control them. And you allow something to occupy so much of your behavior and action and calendar you give that storm so much space and so much more energy than it deserves. Second, don't let a storm define you. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Storms should not tell you who you are. You know, some people have a storm in their life, and they allow that storm to be their identity. We, a Christian should never say, hi, my name, is, my name is Paul and I'm a widower. Or, hey, my name is Debbie and I have cancer. That's not who you are. Christians are children of God. We are made in his image. The Bible says that you are a new creation in Christ. That's your identity now. That is who you are. Listen, you are not the storm. So don't allow the storm to define you. Don't allow the storm to distract you. Proverbs says, the man, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. 
Don't you believe that God has a plan for your life? That your life has a purpose? Listen, God made you for a reason. And there's no storm that's going to come up against God's will. You know, there are people who blame all their storms on the devil or demons. But you know what? Even if that were true, there's no storm that can deter God. Jesus told his disciples, not even the gates of hell will deter my church. Think about, and if you have to, I mean, close your eyes for a minute. What's the thing that you're most afraid of? I mean, can you picture it? Can you imagine yourself in a boat being tossed about by the wind and the waves, feeling the boat rock, the sky is dark, the rain is coming down and you feel lost and directionless and alone? Do you think Jesus has abandoned you? Because you've prayed. You've cried out for help and you feel like your voice is just lost in the sound of the crashing thunder. Hear these words from Jesus. It is I. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of darkness. I am light. Do not be afraid of death. I am life. Do not be afraid of sin. I am salvation. It is I. Do not be afraid. The next verse says, then they were glad to take him in the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Put that statement up against your worst fear. It is I. Don't be afraid. Listen, sickness may destroy the body, our money may sprout wings and fly away, but what is all of that compared to the words of Jesus? It is I, do not be afraid. He can perform miracles and calm whatever problems we have and we will immediately get to where we are going. The reality is that Believers in Jesus often face dangers and peril, but Jesus comes to us right in the midst of our problem, just in time, and calms our fears and brings us safely to shore. It is I. Do not be afraid. See, the passage teaches us that Jesus can work miracles to help people. Believe it. This story is not a story about Jesus walking on water. It is about a God who sees you and knows what you're going through and he comes across the trouble to help you. Of course he can. Of course he can. And he can walk all over anything that scares you. And he got them immediately to the shore, three and a half miles away. What took the disciples seven or eight hours to do, Jesus does in a moment. He rescued those disciples miraculously. And I want you to see that he will rescue you. Even when you are being tossed about by the wind and the waves, or if you are caught up in the storm of sin, Jesus will come supernaturally and rescue you. He will calm your fears, he will calm the storm, and he will bring you safely to the shore so that we can marvel at him, so that we can worship him. Let's pray. Lord, we know that there are those who are in the storm right now. The tornadoes may have passed, but now the suffering begins. The questions arise. 
Why me? What am I going to do? What's next? People are praying for strength. People are praying for wisdom. People are praying for resources. People are praying for answers. And so whether it's financial hardships, whether it's relationship issues, issues of health, education, government, walk across the waters and bring comfort the way only you can. Walk across the waters and bring peace the way that you only can. Walk across the waters and bring healing the way only you can. Continue to conquer our fears, to calm the storm, and to bring us safely home. Lord, you are welcome in my boat anytime. Your presence calms me. Your presence brings me joy. And I worship you. I worship you with all that I have. We thank you for each ray of sunshine, each blade of grass, each calming breeze, each bird that chirps, the smile that you bring to our face, and the love that we feel in our heart. May we share that same love with our brothers and sisters in this world. May we share your love each and every day. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Of course, I would r remind you that we're here. You know, we're here uh, at the church and we're, uh, we, have, we have services every single Sunday. We have our traditional service at 930. So we're going to have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to take communion. We're going to uh, say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up with. In between services, we have coffee, we have donuts, we have a time of fellowship where you get to know one another. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. Come casual, come however you feel the most comfortable. Uh, we have a worship band and we have a children's program from birth all the way through high school. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.